Welcome into Inside the Arc. I'm your host, Alec Bussey, joined as always by Brandon Simberg. We've got a lot to break down in the world of Illini basketball, especially after their close win against UTRGV. We've got a basketball commitment from a Baylor transfer, Sims' favorite school in the country to watch play. And of course, we are going to preview briefly the Illini game against Notre Dame on Monday night in the ACC Big Ten Challenge. But before we get into that, Sim, how are we doing, man? Doing well. Uh, if my feed goes out during this po- during this podcast, it's because I was trying to find a streaming site for Stanford in Colorado before this, and I clicked on some sketchy links. So if the Russian mob has gotten a hold of my laptop mid-podcast, that's why. But other than that, uh, I'm doing well, Alec. How about yourself? I'm doing really well. And, you know, we've kind of joked in the past about doing a, you know, like update, like a pod update on the Pac-12. I think we should do one of those, but I think we should do it on the Pac-12 football. So concerning the breaking news of Lincoln Riley uh, leaving Oklahoma for USC, can I get a wee update from Brandon Sinberg on the Pac-12 football situation? Yeah, the not wasn't a great year in the Pac-12 for football with Oregon. It's never a good year. Kind of choking, but Lincoln Riley, you know, he, he had the Oklahoma job. He saw that they were going to the SEC. He saw the tough competition that might be there. And he said, you know what? I don't want to play Nick Saban and Georgia every year. I'm going to go to the Pac-12 and he's going to bring his high powered offense there. He's going to get it. He's going to get USC back to peak powers where they'll be in the, fi- the, is that what's called the final four, the, whatever the four teams college football playoff, the college football playoff. And they'll probably get stomped by these SEC teams, but you can bank on USC being back in the college football playoff. So this is a big win for the SEC and, or for the Pac-12 in football. Is Pac-12 football officially back? I don't think we ever left. I mean, you look at the all-time NCAA championship standings. You got Stanford at one. You got USC at three. Not for football, for all for all sports. Cal recently moved to 11th. They got bumped out of the top 10. So Pac-12, it has never left. It is the Conference of Champions. And as someone who has a deep connection to USC basketball, Sim, how does it make you feel that USC football is once again the dominant force on campus? What, they got to produce first. USC basketball, as of November 28th, has more wins this year than USC football. So Lincoln Riley has got to get them back because USC basketball is a wagon. They're 6-0. and old. They just won some ESPN Anaheim event uh, carrying Pac-12 basketball right now. Them in Arizona, the only undefeated teams. So USC basketball, it's still a powerhouse. Now they just have two powerhouse programs. And this has been your We Update of the Pac-12 from Brandon Simberg on Inside the Arc. Thanks for listening, everyone. All right, let's dive into it. I'm happy we were able to do that. I kind of had to throw that in there. We got to talk about the Pac-12 more, Conference of Champions, because then all you look up and all of a sudden four teams are in the Sweet 16 and we didn't talk about them all year, so. <laughs> all right, let's kind of dive into it. Let's start with some of the breaking news coming out of Illinois' press conference today with Brad Underwood We're recording this on Sunday night. Sounds like the Illini are going to be shorthanded again against Notre Dame on Monday night in the ACC Big Ten Challenge. Trent Frazier is still dealing with that knee injury that he suffered against Kansas State in the, I guess, Constellation game of the Hall of Fame Classic on Tuesday night. Sounds like that might be a little bit more than a hyperextended knee, which is what most of us had heard. DeMonte Williams said in his kind of media availability, media scrum, that he's dealing with a bone bruise. So that's obviously a little extra reason for concern. Still no update on Andre Curbelo's availability or Jacob Grandison's ability, but it does sound like the flu is going through the Illini locker room. Coach Underwood said, you know, that players have had diarrhea, players have been throwing up. Sorry for the graphic image. For those of you listening, I apologize. But it sounds like it's spread to other players. Brandon Pajemski was at practice today wearing a mask, which that's an odd thing to see even in this world of COVID. Uh, Sounds like Benjamin Boston's Redonk has now felt ill. I've seen images of him on social media wrapped up on the couch in a blanket with tea and a mug. I think I saw that on Saturday night. Jacob Grandison still sick from what I understand. So it's a it's an interesting situation in the Illini basketball world. Like Brad Underwood legitimately like said, like, I don't know who I'm gonna have available at practice. And I think he knew he was going to have available at practice, but when he says he doesn't know who's going to start against Notre Dame, I actually hundred percent believe that. Cause I think there's a very real fear in his mind that player X wakes up and has a high fever on Monday and is, is not able to go sim. So like, this is just a very difficult time to diagnose 
what the Illinois roster is going to look like against Notre Dame. Yeah, so there's this term, uh, it's in the NFL, it's called like the Super Bowl, Super Bowl hangover, where a team has a really good year, they make the Super Bowl, they win or lose, and then the next year just kind of everything doesn't go right for them, and they're not in the playoffs all of a sudden after being one of the top two teams the year before. And it feels like Illinois is having that Super Bowl hangover that year from hell. After the great year last year, you go in the offseason and like, you know, you lose Adam Miller, you lose three assistants, Kofi Coburn enters the transfer portal and comes back. And like, even, but like a month before the season, you, you thought things would be, you thought things would still be okay. And they kind of held it together and Illinois would be able to be really good again. And then right before the season hits, you have the Kofi suspension you have Frazier and Curbelo getting injured in the exhibition games. And now they're both injured again with Frazier with a completely different injury. Curbelo, no one's even really sure what he's hurt with. You know, like he had the concussion and we think it might be concussion, like the concussion symptoms. But me and you have both noticed him. He rolled his ankle in the second game in Kansas City, I believe. And you've noticed him, you know, pointing to his foot, holding his foot, not really moving the same. So like both your starting guards now with two different injuries, six games into the season it's just it just feels like the basketball gods are against Illinois right now and it's it's really hard to assess this team of where I think they're at when we saw them together for full strength once I guess they were full strength against Cincinnati although they didn't have Luke Goody um but like they were mostly at full strength but that was their first game together you know that beginning of the season is a great time when you play these these Jackson States these Arkansas States to kind of get your guys in rhythm, get them playing with each other. And now Illinois is going to be shorthanded again for at least an Notre Dame game. And then you have two Big Ten games coming up. And there's just – there's not a lot of time here to get their rhythm because mo- almost every game here on out, you know, maybe with the exception of um, – what's that game in the 18th? St. Francis, Pennsylvania, and then Florida a and I feel like every game is losable because it's a high major opponent. So it, it just feels like the year from hell right now where they can't get these guys together on the court. Yeah, and it's just it has to be incredibly frustrating for Brad Underwood to go into practice and just like not know who's gonna be available. And like he said after the UTRGV game, which we're gonna kind of break down here in a second or two, but he said after that that like he dreads getting the text from Paul Schmidt every morning, the team's trainer or team's doctor, about what player is dealing with what, what player is sick, what player has whatever ailment that they just aren't aren't expecting and that like obviously only had to do that last year right with COVID and it was totally different and you're waiting on your COVID test to come back every single morning but this is totally different like and I Brad today speaking about players getting sick and having the flu like he's saying like they've had to put a bigger emphasis on players putting their mask on players you know, washing their hands players doing all of those things that we've been told to do since we were kids to try and avoid getting sick. Right. And like, Sim, you live in the same building that a lot of these guys do your neighbors with a couple of them. And that's a very big apartment building, right? Like that's an apartment building that has, I'm up, up several hundred thousands of kids probably living in it. Like everyone who's listening to this podcast, who's been on a college campus or has gone to college understands how quickly illnesses spread on college campuses, because it's basically just like a massive Petri dish. And you were sick right before Thanksgiving. I was sick right before Thanksgiving. I had a bunch of friends who were sick right before Thanksgiving. And it sounds like that same kind of thing kind of made its way over to the Illinois basketball team. And that's just something like you can't deal with. And we've seen this in college football. Michigan State had a huge problem. I think they had like 20 or 21 players out um, a couple weeks ago. And that's just something you have to deal with. That's life. That's part of a season. But you don't ever want to have to deal with it. And when you have players with high fevers, with just ailments that like they can't get out of bed, that's what Brad Underwood said, how bad Brandon Pajemski was before the UTRGV game. That's difficult. And that leaves you in a spot where you don't know who's going to be in that situation the next day because you share a locker room, you share a practice court, you're sharing a film room, you're sharing all these different things. And yeah, like you can be wearing a mask, but if it's the flu, like, you cough in your arm, you do whatever, like things spread and you can only do so much. So it has to be incredibly frustrating. And then injuries with Trent Frazier and Andre Curbelo, like those are obviously just so out of your hand. And then Luke Goody, who we saw against UTRGV provided a real like comforting, like well, comforting, like calming presence 
in that game, you feel like he could have provided that potentially against Cincinnati on Monday in the Hall of Fame Classic. And I don't think he's coming in and preventing a 20-point loss to the Bearcats, but he might come in and do a little something here or there. And they missed him against Cincinnati, I thought. And especially the way he played against UTRGV, like they needed him against that on Friday. And they really, I don't think, win that game without Luke Goody. So to get him back is good, but like, who's to say he doesn't wake up with a huge fever tomorrow, right? And I hate to be that kind of person, but it's just tough. And I don't know how you adapt to this. And I think Brad Underwood is struggling with it too, because they didn't even have a full practice on Saturday. That's two days before a game. That's like when you're supposed to have your like main practice, your like complete install, your understanding of what game plan is, scouting report, all those things. Oh, I didn't have that. They have like a small basic walkthrough, essentially. That doesn't bode well for a game in less than 48 hours of that practice. Yeah, it, it just, it feels like nothing can go their way. You know, like I do want to talk about the three games we've seen for like the, or the last three games, because it's been three games since we did a podcast, but like, and I guess they were at full strength for Cincinnati. Like we can't talk basketball, but it's just, it's so hard to judge this team right now before we like, just before we can see them on the court together. And who knows when we're going to see them on the court together. It It's also kind of weird. You know, last year was the year where team, you know, COVID was way more rampant across the country and you saw teams get shut down with COVID and Illinois was, did a great job um, avoiding any of that stuff last year. It, it's just, didn't have a positive test all season. Yeah. And like they miss any games. Everyone was relatively healthy. It just, it's just weird that it happened to be this year, but I mean, I do want to talk about the basketball. So we had games in Kansas City last week, a uh, 20-point loss to Cincinnati, then an eight-point win over Kansas State, and then on Friday, a nine-point win over UT Rio Grand Valley, Grande Valley, something like that. Uh, I guess just large takeaways from the last three games, what have you kind of noticed? Their defense is just not what I expected it to be, right? Like, coming in, I thought the expectation were they two – in Kempom preseason defensive efficiency, is that what they were saying? Or they won? I, they got up to like number one yeah. after their first two games, didn't they? I I don't really pay attention to Kempom uh, prior to like January. So yeah, I, I don't either because it's so much based on projections. But you know, like the way Illinois has guarded against Cincinnati, the way they guarded against Kansas State, and particularly the way they guarded against UTRGV, it was just terrible. Like just they're not guarding the dribble at all, especially against Rio Grande Valley. Like Coleman Hawkins got beat off the dribble. Austin Hutcherson got beat off the dribble. You saw Alfonso Plummer get beat off the dribble and he's not a great defender, but still like that's frustrating because it's a basic scouting report thing to know that this guy likes to go right. And they're not stopping that. It's just discipline things that are just really bad. And you see Coleman Hawkins jumping a lot. You see Kofi Coburn, trying to go for shots that he can't block, but he's jumping anyway. And that's not Kofi Coburn's game. We've seen that for two years now. Kofi Coburn's not an elite shot blocker. He's a good rim protector because he's so big and he alters so many shots because of that, but he's not an elite shot blocker. He never has been because he doesn't get off the floor really well at a high rate of speed, like an Omar Payne does for an example, an easy example for Atlanta fans to understand. But like, defensively they have a lot to fix and brad underwood said on sunday you know like worse like we were soft against future gv and i thought they were too like they didn't really dominate the rebounding battle very well that's concerning i would say the least like you should be dominating them in the rebounding battle and you should be kind of owning them in other areas and they didn't do that and that's concerning. And Brad said that that's the biggest sin like you can have for one of his teams. And he doesn't know where it's at right now. And he kind of said some of it's on me, but then he also said, you know, like I haven't been able to have really tough practices with this team because I haven't had an ability to, because no one's been healthy or we've had guys sick. So like he hasn't had a full team yet to have a difficult practice to really grind them physically and mentally and force them to toughen up. And that to me is concerning. Yeah, so on the defense, I think that Illinois, um, it's they're having they're they, they don't have like two way players right now. If that makes sense, like when Carbello's been out there, 
he's been a mixed bag on been a mixed bag on offense, but like, and you knew he was never going to be an elite defender, so he kind of had to be like this elite floor general to offset his defense. But he hasn't been that good on defense. The one positive I think for the past three games has been the emergence of Alfonso Plummer, who is absolutely scorching the nets, has become a favorite of mine and yours. He looks like the guy I saw in the Pac-12 last year. And they need him offensively because they're not the offensive unit they were last year. Guys aren't shooting as well. So they kind of need a shooting on the floor, but he's just not that good of a defender. You know, he's not that big. He's got a guard twos. Um, I will say he's strong. Like he can fight through ball strings pretty well. Yeah. But like, and he doesn't like, move yeah, very well laterally. Like he doesn't stay in front of the ball very well. Box plus minus is another stat that's kind of like shaky this early on. Cause a lot of it's like, what well, lineups have you been in? But Alfonso Plummer, a plus 5.7 offensive box plus minus, which is good. Negative 0.5 defensive box plus minus. So like they're not, they're when he's on the floor, they're not good defensively. So like, you know, those guys are kind of your offensive guys. And then in terms of defense, like you want to play DeMonte Williams because his defense is really good and he makes hustle plays. He has, doesn't screw up, but he's two for 12 from three on the year. Like he's, he's completely regressed as a shooter and looks more like the guy we saw his junior year as opposed to last year. I think a lot of that stems from scouting reports now know he now knows he can shoot and they run him off the line and the open looks aren't as there. But now if he's not shooting well, it makes it more stagnant on offense, but you kind of need to play him for his defense. Uh, Jake Grandison's been just kind of a mixed bag all around. Like I don't think he's been particularly good on offense or defense. He kind of has moments both ways, but he hasn't been that effective. And so I think when you look at the, the defense, it's just like, Last year, DeMonte was a two-way player because you knew what you were getting from him on defense and you knew he was going to hit open threes. Grandison was a little bit better, isn't consistent on defense, but he was hitting open threes. Uh, Frazier, you know, he could be in the lineup as the perfect defensive guard next to Io, and he's been hurt, so that hurts the defense. I just think that the they're not, they don't have two-way players right now, and it's really hard to find the best lineup because I don't know, like, what's going to work both ways. I hate to use a Brad Underwood term, but they don't seem to play very connected. Like they don't seem to have a lot of connectivity right now. And in the past, like he said that, and I've kind of questioned like what the heck that even means, but now I kind of understand it watching this team play. Like they just, they don't always seem to kind of understand what, what the other people on the court are supposed to do, especially on the defensive end. And I feel like that kind of leads to guys just kind of floating around and not necessarily understanding what the assignment is or not understanding what the scouting report says that one player is going to do. And I'll just use this as a specific example. And I don't remember the exact shooter for UTRGV, but Luke Goody helped way too much on a ball that was in the paint and left his shooter wide open in the corner, kick out threes made. And as Goody's running back down the sideline, Brad Underwood says to him, if you help that much again, I'm taking you out. Like that's just a basic, right? Like that's a basic scouting report thing that you need to understand. And I get that he's a freshman and it's difficult when you're a freshman to kind of, you know, lock in on all those things, remember all those things on the fly, because when you're in high school, you get away with those things when you're a division one, big 10 basketball player, because you're the best athlete on the floor. But now like Luke Goody needs to know those things. And Luke Goody has been really good defensively. And I, I will give all the praise in the world. And there's a story up at orange and blue news, on rivals.com that like, I wrote that it's very praiseworthy of him with quotes from coach Underwood about how good he's been, about how tough he is, about how competitive he is, about his IQ, about all of those different things. Right. And those things are important. And that's why I think he's going to be a big part of Monday night's game against Notre Dame, because I don't know who else is going to be healthy. Yeah. I think um, one guy we've seen kind of get some more reps now is Austin Hutcherson and, I think he has, he's had moments, but it's been kind of a mixed bag and it's like just not super consistent right now. And I think Hutch has some of the tools to be a good two-way player, but this, we talk about, you know, Illinois needs game reps to get in game form. Austin Hutch just needs game reps. You know, he hasn't, he hasn't played since we were freshmen in college and we're now seniors. So like, it looks okay at times, but I actually think Luke as a freshman is the more solid option. So, and he's a guy. Yeah, we talk about two-way players. Luke could be that two-way guy. He doesn't, you know, he seems solid on defense, and I trust him to hit an open three right now more than I trust a DeMonte Williams or more than I trust Nasa Hutcherson. So it's, you know, we, in the preseason, we talked about Luke might be a ninth or tenth guy. His opportunity is coming. They're, they're going to need him. And I think he's a kid who can step up to the, step up to the plate and kind of be ready to go. But we'll see. That's a lot of pressure. Well, and I would like to say, too, that now I feel like Luke Goody's 
going to play himself into a role bigger than what we thought he would throughout the rest of the season, even when they're fully healthy. And maybe the same can be said for RJ Melendez. And maybe if Trent Frazier's out a couple weeks and Andre Corbello dealing with this neck thing or his ankle thing for a while and isn't fully healthy, that gets Brandon Pajemski on the floor for a couple more minutes here and there. Like maybe all of those things happen, but I feel damn confident that I think Luke Goody is going to be playing upwards of 10 minutes for a while here because I think they're just going to need help and they need bodies and they need people that they can rotate in and you can trust him to make the right play. Like that kid is just smart. You talk to him intelligent wise. You can tell he's just really smart. He's a good kid in the classroom, good student, but also basketball IQ wise. So I'm like, you've talked to him more than I have. I think like he blows me away when I have conversations with him in terms of what he understands in the game. And I was the same way with Coleman Hawkins last year. Right. And it's just, translated this year as well with what we've seen Coleman do but like Luke just kind of understands the game he understands where people are supposed to be he understands what's a good play what's a bad play and when you don't have bodies and you can go and you can be trusted to go out there and not take a terrible shot that's going to get you minutes especially when you're guarding on the other end and you can rebound a little bit as well too so I think Luke is going to get more minutes and I do think we should talk about Austin Hutcherson Brad Underwood saying he's on a minutes restriction whether that's because of the stress fracture in his back, whether that's because of the bruised tailbone that he suffered earlier this year, or they're just trying to be careful with him because of those injury things that he's gone on with the past and they want to prevent something from happening again in the future. There's been times where he's flashed. For example, he had the really nice finish against Cincinnati, or no, against Kansas State on Tuesday at the rim. He had another really nice finish against UTRGV at the rim. But he's also had a lot of turnovers. He had five turnovers against UTRGV on Friday night, struggled with his inbound passes, really struggled on the defensive end, especially against the dribble. There's times where I feel like he plays in slow motion, if that makes sense, where I feel like he doesn't play at his full speed. And maybe that's just because, like, he doesn't understand. Maybe that's because he's still kind of figuring it all out. He's just kind of gliding, right? But when he plays at his full speed, he's shown really impressive drives to the rim. And I feel like if you can continue to get those a little bit more out of him, that's something that would benefit him offensively. Because I don't know who else on Illinois' roster can do that. I mean, Jacob Grandison, maybe when he's healthy, but like we didn't see that last year. Demonte Williams hasn't done that at all in his career. Trent Frazier hasn't really done it since he was a freshman. And I'm not overly confident in his ability to finish at the rim. Andre Carbello struggled with his floaters. He struggled with his finger rolls. He struggled with mid-range runners this season I don't know who else can do that on this roster like you need those shots to go in yeah and I will say on Hutch like he's built as a shooter everyone says he can shoot he's 0 for 4 in three games and like that's okay but like you know I think he'll get there eventually but like I said Illinois doesn't have time for it. he will get there eventually he will do this eventually you know, Illinois, got, Illinois needs guys to hit their full potential and start playing well right now as they have the stretch of Notre Dame, Rutgers, and Iowa coming up. And neither of those teams are, like, great. If Illinois was at full strength, I think Kofi alone could manhandle all of them and they'd win. But now they're not at full strength, so they need guys to step up. And when you you already are playing Curbelo and Kofi, whether Curbelo plays tomorrow night, but, like, you're already playing two non-shooters, like, I think we're at the point now where we can kind of call Corbello a non-shooter. I think I've seen enough from him, unfortunately. Like, this, the jump shot leap is not there. So, you're going to play two non-shooters. The confidence in shooting it's there, which was um, half the battle, right? Yeah, it just does not look good. But then if, if Hutcherson's not going to hit shots, like, if you're playing three non-shooters, that's going to make the offense stagnant. And I think in a game like Cincinnati, when you had Corbello and Kofi out there, non-shooters, like, I think that's kind of why they get stagnant at times. Guys just aren't hitting shots right now. Demonte Williams, not been a great shooter. Grandison's been up and down. Coleman Hawkins has unfortunately not been that good of a shooter. Like, talk about all, in the offseason, Illinois has so many, like, shooting weapons, and it just not has, has not manifested its shot itself thus far. And we can talk you – know, you can break down a game so much, talk about X's and O's, should they do this, who should play together. End of the day, like, it's a make-or-miss game, and they're missing right now. And – if there's any reason that you should have hope that this can flip offensively for Illinois, it's Alfonso Plummer the last two games, right? Like I, I would have to go look at what his percentages were this season in his first couple of games. And I'll pull it up here. I guess now this is great podcasting. You get to listen to me ramble as I type in 
Alfonso Plummer's stats, but you that's shooting is something that can flip really fast because guys just oh make shots or guys will miss shots on a game by game basis. And here it is pointed up now in Illinois' first four games, Plummer was 27% from the three point line, and he is now up to 47% on the season from the three point line. Like three point shooting can change, shooters can start making shots. And maybe that's what happens with Andre Curbelo, right? Like, yeah, he's two of 12 on the season right now from behind the arc. And he's 11 of 31 from two point range. But like, that was a concern coming into the year. He didn't show last year, a high ability to make shots. Now he's not carrying it over to this season. And now he's battling injuries and he's not going to be able to get up as many shots and reps that he needs to get up. So like, I have a tough time expecting him to start making shots and Coleman Hawkins, you talk about a mixed bag. That's been a mixed bag for Illinois. When he's been good, I think he's been pretty good. And that's been when Illinois has been good. But man, Sam, when he's been bad, he, he's been bad. And Illinois has been bad too. And you made a really good point when we were texting about this, that you know we expected him to potentially have a role this season. He's now starting. And he needs to be one of their best players now when everyone's out and it's tough for him to do that. That's a huge jump. The kid played 6.3 minutes a game last year to go from being a 6.3 minute, a game guy who had multiple DMPs and big time play to you need to be one of Illinois three best players when you're on the court. And now with Curbelo and Trent out top two, right? Like top three, if you want to throw a plumber in there, like yeah, I'd put plumber two right now, but yeah. Like, that's just too big of a jump. You're asking too much of a kid, right? Like, he's just not there yet. And maybe come January, February, early March, maybe he is there. And by next year, by gosh, I bet he is there because you and I are both really high on his game. But you just can't put that much on the kid right now. And that's part of the problem that goes back to you just aren't healthy, whether it's injuries or health or illness-wise right now. I felt, I felt like you were speaking to me uh, there because I was the one who was hyping Coleman. And yeah, the hype probably got, you know, he had some good games against some low majors and the hype probably got out of control. But yeah, like he, he at least worked his way to starting lineup. And, you know, Illinois isn't like, I think of a team like UCLA and they have five-star freshman Peyton Watson, who's obviously talented, but he has growing pains right now and he makes mistakes. And like UCLA has like the... I'm blanking on the word here, but like they can, they can afford to bench him and be like, you know what? You don't have it right now. We're going to go to a senior. Illinois doesn't have, like you said, Illinois doesn't have that. They can't be like, okay, Coleman, you messed up here. Let's sit you. Let's talk about it. They kind of got to let him play through it. And I do still like a lot of things he brings in terms of hustle plays, offensive rebounds, passing to Kofi, keeping possessions alive. But yeah, there's just going to be times where he's going to make a mistake, get beat, take a bad shot. And unfortunately they have to live with it. Yeah. Um, I do want, so we're kind of on the topic of the front court now. Yeah, and you were at the UT RGV game. I was like, I didn't even watch it yet. Uh, sorry about that. But uh, the th- when, when checking the box score, I think the thing that stuck out most to me, and as far as we know, he's 100% healthy, is Omar Payne playing two minutes. I mean, what, it, what have you seen there in the front court? Well, Brad said after the game that he played two minutes because he wanted Kofi on the court because Kofi was dominating the game, which he was. I mean, Kofi finished with. I, I do see now that Kofi played 38 minutes. So I guess yes, Kofi played 38 minutes, had 38 points. That's just an odd thing to say in college basketball. 38 points, uh, 10 rebounds, um, drew 10 fouls, which is insane. Made, uh, I guess, what was it? Eight of 11 from the free throw line. Like that's a, incredible game but even against Cincinnati and Kansas State yeah. Kofi played 32 minutes yeah. and 27 minutes and Omar still only played six minutes and four minutes so they clearly don't trust him right now no they don't and I don't know if it's a motor thing I don't know if it's he can't do anything offensively but dunk and he doesn't seem to really do much defensively but block shots right now but he was expected to be better than this and it's concerning that he's not. It makes you question the development. It makes you question, okay, maybe Omar Payne was just a misevaluation when you think about where he was ranked as a recruit. And maybe he 
was just a misevaluation, was a transfer, whatever it is. And maybe that's an overreaction. I don't know. Like maybe come January, February, I'm saying good things about Omar Payne, but like, I just don't see it right now. Like he doesn't look like he, his energy just isn't there. Right. And this goes back to what we were saying earlier on a previous podcast with Georgie Bishanish Philly. It's like, at least with Georgie, you knew we were going to get energy when he came into the game. I don't even know if you get that with Omar. Like blocks and dunks are supposed to be the biggest energy swinging plays offensively and defensively for any team. And like, I feel like he makes those. And I don't feel like it like really alters the energy that only has. Like, that's weird. That's weird to say. And yeah, there was times Georgia came in and used his energy in a negative way, but at least he came in and he talked and he was active and he was positive for the most part. Like you're not getting that from Omar Payne right now. Like, what are you supposed to do at this point? Yeah, you, you, I think you mentioned that Omar's kind of been a zero on offense. Again, going back to box plus minus, Omar Payne is plus 4.4 on defense. So when he's out there on defense, it's actually been okay, at least for the advanced stats. Um, he is negative 5.9 on offense. <laughs> like, per, that's they're negative 5.9 points on offense per 100 possessions when he's out there. Like, it, it is like playing four on five at this point when he's on offense. And, yeah, it just doesn't look good. Um, in terms of what this means for the staff, you know, I don't think this was a missy Val because I think they saw a guy with athletic tools, like with the tools and, and the motor and it was always the motor and like kind of the IQ that was always the problem in Florida. And if you believe in your staff and you believe in yourself as develop as development coaches, you believe you can fix that. But I just think in terms of like mental, I don't know if you can always fix a motor. I don't know if you can get somebody to play harder. And then he would never say this. He, you know, would never, you would never say this publicly, but maybe he was discouraged when Kofi Coburn came back and he saw that he was probably going to get 12 minutes. Like, you know, it's hard for a guy like that who's had three years now of someone coming back and playing over him to be like, it's, I get why it's hard to play hard. I get why the motor's not there. And like, I'm not making excuses for him, but I just think it's hard to teach a motor, especially in a position where, you know, no matter how hard I play, I'm never going to be the starter. So I'm concerned. And if Omar Payne isn't a great backup five, like it is what it is. You don't need a great backup five to win. I'd like, you don't need a back, great backup five to be a great team, but it it's not great right now. Well, and you definitely don't need one when Kofi Coburn looks like he's looked in the what, three games he's played. Yeah, three games he's played. I mean, this is going to be an overreaction. You're going to hate this. But, like, he's been just as good as Drew Timmy has been this year. And granted, the competition hasn't been as good across the board, but he's been really, really good. And he's shown things that he hasn't shown in the past. And I still think Timmy's a better player. I still think Timmy is probably going to end up being the front runner for player of the year when this thing is all said and done, if it's not Paolo Bancaro. Because I was going to say, Paolo, Paolo. It should be Paolo Bancaro because he's the best player in the country and he's the best NBA draft prospect. Since who actually? I'm gonna put you on the Zon, spot. Probably not. Uh, honestly, I thought K was a better prospect, so I don't. Oh, really? I did. Yeah. Okay. Um, so since I mean, we've had a good stretch here with Cade and Zion in the past three years, but yeah, Paolo's been a, a dude. Okay. So, but like Kofi's been incredibly good, right? Like 38 points, 10 rebounds against UTRGV. He had over 20, I think, in both okay. of the. He, no, only just, he, didn't get Cincy. he He only had yeah. But he was – I don't even know he what was, he was. He was 7 for 13. Like, I didn't think he played bad, but I just think sometimes defenses can do things to take yeah. him out. And, and, they, and Cincinnati has a lot of size. They had a lot of bodies they could throw at him. I mean, they had three guys who were six foot ten or bigger, and they play all three of them. So, like, that's really tough for only to match up against, even with Kofi, because you have 15 fouls you can throw at him, essentially. And the things just started going bad for Illinois in that game. They stopped being able to get him the ball. But he's been really good, right? And, like, he's shown an ability to do things that he didn't do last year. I think he has three assists this year. I'd have to look at it. And they've all been pretty good passes. Like, three assists, like, that doesn't sound like a lot, but that's a lot <laughs> for Kofi Coburn. And I, God bless his soul. The guy hit a step-back mid-range shot with the shot clock winding down against Kansas State, like, that is not something that I ever thought I would see Kofi Coburn do. And he did it. And he pulled a mid-range jump shot. Was it? He pulled another one against Kansas City. I forget to get 
I forget if it was against Kansas State or Cincinnati, but he did it. And he it was like on the shot clock, yeah. He did it, and he looked confident doing it. And, yeah, like, you don't need to, like, do those all the time. But God bless the kid for having the confidence to do it, and God bless the kid for improving his game. And you know what? He's been damn impressive around the rim. Like, his footwork is so much better. His touch is so much better. He's got an, a new repertoire of moves. Tim, I've seen him go baseline, reverse layup, like, four times. He didn't do that at all in his first two years. That's awesome development from him. And do I think he's an NBA player yet? I don't know. I still don't know. But I kind of believe that, like, he can maybe work himself into one if he keeps developing like he is. Because, like, he's shown a real growth. And that's good, especially for him. I think the, the last thing on his growth, I don't feel like it's going to be a miss when he goes to the free throw line now. It, it looks yeah, perfect. he's shooting 67%. That's good. 67.9, like, and on, like, over nine attempts per game right now. I don't feel like it's going to be a miss. Like, it just you looks good. Um, I'll make the Drew Timmy argument and say that he had 38 against Texas, and I don't think Kofi's even played a tournament team yet. Uh, horns down. But, <laughs> um, uh, but no, Kofi has, like, I, I, I want to see it against a Hunter Dickinson, Zach Eady type. Like, can he still make that move when there's another seven-footer kind of but in his area, but yeah, Kofi definitely looks better. Like I, I'm, we've kind of complained about a lot of guys uh, in the past 30 minutes. I won't complain about Kofi at all. I think he's been really good. He looks better. Well, and I'll say this, he's been be- like, I, I haven't watched a whole bunch of Hunter Dickinson and I haven't watched gone back to like do a film dive on him either, but like he still has no right hand at all. Like I've watched Michigan enough. He has no right hand. He's not confident in it. He doesn't go to it very often. When he does, it's always short. That's he's the, he's the I would yeah I've watched enough Michigan. He hasn't gotten like that much better. He has a nice little floater game, but and he's still he's a definitely a better passer. But I would say Hunter Dickinson is probably the fifth best big in the Big Ten right now. And that's because Purdue has two of the top. Oh, I didn't even think of the Purdue guys. Who are you uh, thinking? Kofi. Kofi. Trey Jackson Davis, forty three the other night. He's averaging twenty points per game. I think I'd rather have Trace right now. Uh, Keegan Murray, I will get to Iowa next weekend, thankfully. But Keegan Murray's having a great year. I'd rather have Keegan than Hunter Dickinson. And I'd rather have Trevian right now. And maybe Zach Eady. I, I don't know. Um, I mean, you'd rather, I have a, you'd rather have a guy coming off the bench. That's how good Purdue's front court is. Yeah, it's a, seriously. I don't know if Hunter Dickinson starts in <laughs> Purdue. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no. Uh, Co- like I said, Kofi is right there. He's going to be. What, like, when I think about Illinois long-term in the Big Ten, I think one thing that's helped them so far is that the Big Ten has kind of fallen flat on its face already. And they How does that they, make you feel? Well, they usually wait till March to do this. Um, and they just said, you know, let's just do it now in November. And outside of outside of Purdue, it just hasn't, like, looked good. Illinois can't get their team on the court. Michigan, two losses they should have won. Michigan State's been okay, but they have two losses. Maryland's never going to be ranked again. I think Rutgers has lost two bye games. Like it, the Big Ten the Big is going to have one or two teams ranked on Monday. One's going to be Purdue. One's going to be Wisconsin. Wisconsin's going to be ranked after winning Maui. Maui bump. The Maui bump. I, and Wisconsin's actually looked okay. I, who knows? Illinois, Illinois is going to fall out. I yeah, think. they're going to. And gonna, if they don't fall out, they're going to be like 23 or 24. They should fall out. They don't they deserve fall to be ranked. Out. Feast week, you know, feast week, like now you have teams like Indiana's undefeated, even though they don't really play anybody. USC's undefeated. Like you have a bunch of teams that now have like seven and oh that you kind of throw in the poll to be like, um, okay, let's give them a chance. I do think Illinois, like my point is that that's why I'm not like overly concerned with Illinois yet, because the Big Ten is not as good as we thought. And Illinois at least has the excuse of, well, we haven't seen what our team looks like. So like to me, I think if it can like I mean, I guess they did lose the Cincy by 20 at full strength, but I still think it's like they can get the guys together. They can get a rhythm. They can be better than Michigan. They can be better than Michigan State. Absolutely. They're going to be better than Maryland. Like, it's it's not like the other teams have closed the gap. They should so be better. And, and Ohio State's been awful. Yeah. Oh, oh I mean, they played really good against Florida, but, like, they don't have a point guard. They don't have – it's it's credit to E.J. Liddell. Like, he has to carry them in every single game, and he almost does. I bet – the best player in the country. I bet on Florida against. He's not the best player in the country, but he might be the best player in the country. Um, I bet on Florida against Ohio State, and it's just like anytime a non EJ guy got the ball, I was like, "This is a win." Anytime someone not named EJ a shot, I was like, "This is a win." And every time EJ got the what ball, what if it was Justin Arns on a swing around the perimeter? He actually had a bad game against Florida. I got lucky, but 
<laughs> they, but Florida ran them off the line. They had the athletes too, at least. But yeah, EJ Liddell has been really good. But yeah, that team, they don't have, if Illinois can get it together, their guards and wings are better. And I don't even think our guards and wings are that good right now. So no. Well, and so, I think this is kind of, this is, this is why I think Illinois could still finish second or third in the Big Ten. It's because who in the Big Ten has a backcourt that is better than Illinois? Purdue. Other than Purdue. Michigan State, maybe. Michigan State, maybe. Like Tyson Walker got a little bit better this week. Gabe Brown's been pretty good. Max Christie's pretty good. So I'd say maybe Michigan State. But but yeah. no one else who I'm like, there's no one else who I'm like looking at. And I'm like, yeah, that's yeah, like they're they're better. I mean, Jaden, Jaden Akins is gonna be a really good player for them at Booker, but like I don't expect him to be like really good. Yeah, not right away. Um, yeah, so that's that's why like, long, like the sky is falling for Illinois right now, <clears throat> and if they keep losing games, it's gonna hurt their seating like long term. You know, I, the committee's gonna give them a break, but at some point you can't just overlook. Like we're a month in right now, so you can't really overlook a month. Like the committee will kind of give them a break, I think. It, but they need to turn around and be like, this is actually the team we are, not that team that lost to Cincinnati and Marquette. So that's like like long term, like. Yeah, this probably is not a national title team. If if that was news to you, I'm, I'm sorry. But I do – like, I still think they can make a run at the top of the Big Ten. You know what's going to happen is, like, we're saying this about them, like, not being a legitimate threat to, you know, make it to the Elite Eight, the Final Four, whatever. Last year, everyone's picking them to do said thing. And this year, they're going to just run rough shot over whatever their region is because that's what happens in March Madness. All right, let's dive into this Notre Dame prep and let's not stick on this for too long because I feel like we've hit on a lot of other things. But coming in, Notre Dame is three and two on the season. They uh, just played in Maui. Maui. The Maui, the Maui yeah. Gym Maui Invitational. Yeah. In the Maui Gym Maui Invitational in Las Vegas. In Las Vegas. At, <laughs> at the T Mobile Center or whatever it is out there. Uh, yeah, so Notre Dame, they've got wins this season against, I guess, Cal State, I, I don't even know. Who North Ridge. Yeah, not, they, they've not got a Pac, not a Pac-12 team. Yeah, they have. Okay, they have. <laughs> they have wins against Cal State, Northridge, High Point, seventy to sixty-one. They lost to St. Mary's in the first round of Maui. St. They Mary's lost, might, might be a Pac-12. I might claim them. I might I might claim them as Pac-12. They're pretty good. Uh, they lost to St. Mary's in the first round of the Maui Gym Invitational in Las Vegas. Um, they then beat Chaminade in the second round of the Maui gym invitational in Maui and Las Vegas. And then they lost to uh, Texas A&M in the final game of the Maui gym, Maui invitational in Las Vegas, 73 to 67 in Texas A&M is obviously one of the lesser power five big 10, big 10 programs on an annual basis in the country. It must be terrible to be a Texas A&M basketball fan. I would like to get that in there briefly. But they now come to uh, Champaign for the ACC Big Ten Challenge. Uh, 8 o'clock tip-off at State Farm Center. I don't really think Notre Dame's very good. They shoot the ball from perimeter a lot, which means it's you and I's kind of brand. That's what we like to watch. Uh, it's but, not, though, because they play slow as heck. I will say it's not like – That's it's not true. Al- it's not Alabama, like, taking – It's not Arkansas. Position. It's – they're 304th in pace. It's so it's like, yeah, they will take threes. And they're also 292nd in the country in percentage. So they, you, got, you kind of got to make threes and play a little bit fast to get me enticed. But so it, in Kempom, they come in number 40 at Kempom, if you care about that at this point. I remember in the summer, we were talking about how ESPN needs to start pushing these ACC Big Ten title announce or ACC Big Ten challenge announcements back until kids decide where they're going from the transfer portal. And I think if they had done that, Ono would be playing what North Carolina. They'd be playing Virginia. I don't think they'd get Duke, but like yeah, I mean the ACC is bad anyway. So it, yeah, I mean they would have gotten one of those teams at the top. Uh, damn, is Brad Underwood fortunate that they didn't do that this year and they get Notre Dame instead? Because playing Duke would not be fun for the second year in a row. Paolo Bancaro would rip Illinois a new one. But anyway, uh, Notre Dame. They come in, and they got a couple of good players. Um, Paul Atkinson comes in averaging about 15 and seven a game. Um, he's a pretty good player for them, six foot nine, six foot ten. Kind of an interesting matchup for Coleman Hawkins, I feel like. They've got a couple of interesting transfers. Um, actually, Atkinson was a transfer from Yale 
um, sat out last season, was the Ivy League player of the year back in 1920. So they've got a couple of interesting pieces. What are you kind of looking at with Notre Dame? Yeah, I mentioned it earlier, but it's it's kind of a, I think it's a pace game. I think if Illinois like knew they're gonna have Andre Carbello, we, we still don't really know his status. I don't think he's gonna play, but I think if we had Andre Carbello, you know, you, you, Illinois would try to push the tempo on this team that likes to play slow, likes to play in the half court, likes to take a lot of threes. Um, and then I think the second thing is they take a lot of threes because they kind of have five guys that can shoot the three. As so far I'm watching the matchup between Kofi Coburn and Nate. Lazuski, he's their uh, foreman, and he's taken 19 threes on the year in six games. So I mean, he's going to get them up. How you know can Kofi guard him on the perimeter on one end, and can he actually make shots? And then on the other end, can Illinois punish him because he's kind of a soft perimeter big? Like Kofi Coburn should have no problem finishing over him inside. So I think that's the matchup to watch. And then at the guard spot, at the Prentice Hub is supposed to be their guy. He's their point guard. He leads them in minutes but he's not shooting well at all 25% from the field. So, but Illinois might not have Trent Frazier to guard him. So, you know, can Illinois slow him down and stop his dribble penetration? Cause he's kind of the other guy I want to watch. You know, it's hard to, it's hard to say with Illinois what, what it's going to look like because of what they're going to have. But the one thing we know they're going to have is Kofi Coburn and they need to give him a high dosage because that's their biggest advantage in this game. Yeah, and the other thing that's interesting with Lazuski is that he's got games with 16 and 15 rebounds this year. So it'll be a nice little challenge for Kofi in the paint, and his size should get him 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 rebounds, I would say. He should win that matchup on the glass. But, you know, good Dane Goodwin's another interesting player. I mean, he's scored in double figures in four of their games this year. He had 17 against Chaminade. I know Chaminade's not – that's Chaminade, the team that normally hosts Maui. Uh, you know, that's obviously not a super high major opponent, but that's a team that, you know, scoring 17 points is impressive. It, my thing with Notre Dame is they don't have much depth. And I mean, they play seven guys. I mean, they might get an eighth guy in there. You want to talk about an advantage for Illinois concerning your current situation with not knowing what you're, what you've got health wise. It's a good thing. You don't have to play a team that's going to throw, you know, eight, nine, 10 guys in their rotation at you, because I think that'd be really, really difficult. I mean, if you were playing like Florida state and Florida state's throwing you nine, 10 guys, like Leonard Hamilton always does, man, that's a, just a tough situation to have to go into, but you know, Notre Dame's not doing that this year. So you feel like even if you go in and you only have seven guys and you've got to play RJ Melendez, 10 to 15 minutes, you got to play Luke Goody, 12 to 18 minutes again, that you might be okay with that because you're, you're not going to be going against a whole bunch of bodies who are really fresh. And you feel like Kofi can give you, I mean, he gave you 38 minutes against UTRGV. Like that's not something that I felt like Kofi did a lot in his first two years at Illinois. So maybe his motor is actually improved from where we have seen it in the past. So if you can get those kind of minutes from Kofi, that's huge. Honestly, I think my biggest key to the game is keeping Kofi out of foul trouble because you don't know what you're going to get out of Omar Payne. You don't really know. You, BBV has struggled against high major opponents. I feel like this year in the minutes he's gotten. Didn't Brad say he's out? Brad said he's sick. And we were supposed to talk to him today, but uh, ended up not being able to talk to him today because he is sick. I don't know if he's in or if he's out. I would say him not talking to us probably isn't a good sign. I know I said this stuff earlier about I, some, something on him on social media. I have uh, I have a Benjamin Bossman's Verdunk update. I, I just thought he was out, but I did walk past him as I was coming to my room to record this podcast in the hallway. And I was like, what's up? And then I said, don't touch me. I heard you're sick. And that's the update. <laughs> well, <you> know, <laughs> can I get a, uh, what did, what was his temperature? He was wearing the jumpsuit. He was in a hood, so I couldn't see his head. So I couldn't really sense the radiation, but I stood, I saw him and, I walk as far away as possible, talk to him down the hall. Yeah, I was just sick, so I'm not trying to get it. <laughs> yeah, no, so I, I don't know if he's expected to play or will be available, but, you know, if he is, can you really count on him for a bunch of positive minutes against a high major opponent? We haven't seen that this year. Um, you need to get something out of Omar Payne, though, if Kofi Coburn gets into foul trouble. So I'm, keeping Kofi out of foul trouble is a huge, huge point of emphasis, and he's done a really good job of that really throughout his career, but you can't have that tomorrow. Cause then you're going to have to go small and that might actually be a matchup advantage because you could do that. Well, with Coleman at the five, with what Notre Dame kind of trots out there, they don't have a seven footer, but you, you want Kofi on the floor. I mean, he's kind of your entire offense right now. Yeah. I, I wondered why we haven't seen Coleman at the five because it was kind of being hyped in preseason 
and clearly this Omar thing like hasn't been what they wanted. And I, I do think some of that is because a Coleman house play a lot of minutes at the four because we don't really have any other wings. And like, like, you know, we still have like guys super healthy right now. So like if you bump Coleman up a slot, you got to put four more guards and wings in. And I don't even know if we have that. And because we've wanted to keep Kofi on the floor, but if they have the depth tomorrow to play Coleman at the five for those spot minutes that Kofi sits, I would love to see it. What's our favorite lineup, Sam? Coleman at the five. <laughs> yeah, it's our favorite. It might not be the best one. I taking Kofi off the floor might not be the best idea, but I mean, I would love, I would love to see Curbelo, Plummer, Hutcherson, Grandison, or Demonte Grandison and Coleman. I mean, I don't even know who's going to be available, but yeah, I'd love to see it. And I think tomorrow would be a matchup if we had the bodies, but who knows what the body. Yeah. I'm just saying, I think and that's kind of like a running joke that I feel like the two of us have. I don't know. I don't know. I, it's tough for me to pick Illinois to win this game. And not because I think Notre Dame is better than Illinois. I think Illinois is significantly better than Notre Dame, especially when at full strength. But I just don't know who Illinois is going to have available. And that makes it so hard for me to pick them. Like if, if they don't have Trent Frazier, if they don't have Andre Curbelo, if they don't have Jacob Grandison, if they don't have, God forbid they lose another guard because I don't know who else would play guard. I don't know how I can pick them. I don't know who would bring the ball up the floor. Like I, 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 I think it's going to be a rock fight. I think it's going to be ugly. I think if this is going to be a game that Brad Underwood talks about, his team was soft against UTRGV. They don't have an edge right now. They don't seem to have the ability to kind of grind it out. They don't look like they put the same kind of heart or passion that they did the, a year ago or even two years ago, especially the second half of that season that COVID ended. Like, man, it, it's tough for me to pick them. I'm not asking you to pick this game because I don't know who to pick in this game because we don't know who's going to be available. This is a podcast where we do pick games. We do make takes. We don't run from the smoke, but I just, I, yeah, I don't really know what to pick in this game. And I think another thing that will help with Illinois is that I don't think Notre Dame's super tough. I watched them in the Maui Jim Maui and like the tough wasn't a word that like struck me with them. Yeah, How they, weird is it to say that about a Mike Bray team? Like think back to like four or five years ago. Like that's how I would describe those Notre Dame teams. Mike Bray's kind of washed. It's, he's not been good lately. Their teams have not been good lately. I don't know like what his contract situation is, but they're not bringing in a lot of recruits. Like, yeah, Notre Dame's just kind of a program. Like it's, it's a football school. So it's like when basketball is good, that's a plus, but they don't have the Pat Connaughton's and the, uh, Bonzi Colson's that they used to have. This this team's kind of soft. So I do think this yeah. like if Illinois just plays a little toughness, but the guys they have with a Brad Underwood identity that he's had at Illinois all these years, they should win regardless of who's in the team because they have Kofi. But I don't know if they're gonna play with that toughness. And that's been our biggest question so far. Yeah, it's just really tough for me to pick it. And I think if gun to my head, I think I would have to pick Notre Dame and a really close, ugly rock head rock fight kind of game i just i'm not picking don't ask me to follow up with a prediction i'm not i'm not, I'm not making it. i can't i can't do it because i just can't pick illinois because i don't know who's gonna play and the last time i saw them play they didn't guard and now they haven't been able to really practice defensively and like that's concerning i i don't know watch them come out and win by 40 watch them be like their like arrival moment and everyone's back in on illinois and they're top 15 in the country in a week all right, let's move to our last topic. Illinois, man, they are hot on the recruiting trail right now. I mean, good Lord, in particular, Tim Anderson. Uh, he gets a commitment and a signing from Ty Rogers. We don't need to talk about that too much. But we do need to talk about the addition of Dane Danger. I think that's how you pronounce it. I was able to talk to him at the game on Friday against UTRGV, and I kind of thought that the commitment would be a potential um, just by the way he was talking about his relationship with Tim Anderson, his interest in the program, his um, kind of belief in how guys have developed and whatnot. But that pops Saturday night after the Illini blow out uh, Northwestern on the football field. He's a really interesting ad, Sim. I think you and I were talking about him and what kind of player he is, what kind of skill set he has. I don't think we have a great comp for him, but a kid who's six foot eight, six foot nine probably a little overweight right now around 
70, that'll need to get cut down to 250, I would say, maybe. It's a more comfortable playing weight for him. So what do you think they're getting in him? Because I kind of like his skill set, but I also feel like this is kind of a gamble for a kid who had foot surgery a year ago and only played in like three games for Baylor this year. Yeah, it's it's a little bit weird to me because there were rumblings in the Illinois staff. I, I heard rumblings in the past few weeks about they have their eyes set on the Kofi replacement. They have their eyes set on the next guy. And, and then he enters the portal. And then like, you know, like once I knew he was coming, he was visiting here, I felt like they were going to get him. And I felt the same I don't really know what to think. Um, I don't really know what to think. Like if this is going to like, he could be a good player, but if we're asking him to fill Kofi's shoes after he's never played a college basketball game, I, you know, like I, and, and maybe he ends up being the backup or maybe he gets down enough to wait and he has enough skill where he can be the four and provide some versatility in the front court. Um, but, you know, he was a, he was a top 100 kid in the 2019 class, I believe, or 2020 class with uh, 2020. Yeah. With Adam Miller. So he was like the 91st overall player in two, four, seven, and he definitely has size. And I think I like him coming from a Baylor program because I think they do things the right way and they develop good habits. So like that, is encouraging and like you said I'm a little I'm a little worried about the weight right now but at least committing now he gets to be here in December um and like train with Fletch and hopefully they can re- rehab his foot get his body right and turn him in, turn him into playing shape and we'll see I, I think this is a huge wild card for the future of the program because you have kind of your backcourt of the future set with I mean Corbello is probably coming back next year you got Epson Harris in this recruiting class you have good young wings like Goody and Melendez and you signed Ty Rogers. Coleman Hawkins probably coming back to the four. Hutcherson, you know, like you have all these wings and guards, but the one thing you were kind of missing was a front court piece if Kofi leaves. So it seems like it's him. And they're super confident on him and they're super in on him. That makes me feel good. It's just a lot of pressure. I, I like how you mentioned the Baylor piece to that. And I think back to, and this is when you were still on the beat, and I do still miss you on the beat, I would like to say. Um, last year when only lost to Baylor, um, I remember Brad Underwood saying after the game, something along the lines about the style that Baylor plays was just really impressive. And you and I were texting about Baylor when they were playing Michigan state on Friday and how just their bigs, um, whether that's full Thamba or I'm just going to say everyday John, uh, cause I, I not even Thomas Chachua. That Ch- Ch- Chama Chachua, yes. Okay, I was kind of close. Chama Chachua. <laughs> Whether those two guys, like, uh, I love how athletic those guys are. And yeah, they're not seven feet. And yeah, they're not your traditional Big Ten banger in the paint kind of player. And I- I'm fine with that. I kind of like the idea that Brad kind of wants to be Baylor and have a big that's really athletic, that can do different things on the perimeter, that can guard know three four positions at a time and can be a matchup nightmare to try and figure out how to guard and if this danger kid pans out the way that they want him to what makes you think that that can't turn into that kind of player in the big 10 right like who in the big 10 do you feel like can comfortably guard him if he turns into that kind of player like there's one or two players off the top of my head who i feel like three players who can maybe guard him EJ Liddell, Keegan Murray, and Travion Williams. And I don't know how comfortable Trace, I am. In I, would say, I would say Trace Jackson Davis. He's been pretty good defensively. Yeah, and Trace can kind of guard on the perimeter because he moves pretty well. But, you know, there's three, four guys who I feel like can maybe guard him in the Big Ten well. Like, I think Hunter Dickinson would get cooked by him. Yeah, I, I think of that Baylor-Illinois game last year. And Baylor went on the run in the second half. And they did all this, like, all this action to set up an empty side pick and roll with Jared Butler and the five man. And how many times do we just see Jared Butler dribbling the paint lob and there's a Baylor big slamming it, whether it was Flo Thamba or Jonathan Chamochachua, you know, if you, that's the thing about basketball in 2021, you don't need to throw the ball to your center every possession. If he's a guy who can set screens on the wings and then roll the hoop and finish lobs and kind of space the other bigs out and make them really move, which is what they did to Illinois that's interesting look. And that's something, like you said, the big 10 doesn't have a lot of, so I feel like this is pretty forward thinking. Um, we just have to see this kid get healthy and get on the court. But, and I don't think that's, I don't think let's say Kofi does leave and a big becomes available in the transfer portal. 
I don't think this necessarily rules them out for going after the best big available either. If they want to just add more. No, because there's nothing that says you can't play this kid at the four. Yeah. And bring and, him off the bench behind Coleman next year. Right. I, I don't, I, I don't think they, maybe they said you're as of right now, if Kofi leaves, you're the starting five, but like, I don't know if they promised that to a kid who's never played a college game. So if someone better becomes available, especially a one year guy. Yeah. I think this rules them out for that. Um, at all. I just, Having never seen him play, I don't have a ton of like surety yeah. of what this is. But again, Tim Anderson, he's hot. He's been oh, on fire. Oh. Like it, this, this has been a like, yeah. Chin Coleman was also a good recruiter. If you want to compare those two guys with the Chicago ties, but Tim Anderson, they've wanted guys. They've gone and got them, and so that's a positive sign. I mean, Tim got them their best rank, their highest ranked player in the twenty two class. He got them. I was going to say a highly touted transfer from Baylor, but I don't know if that's fair to put on Dan Danger yet. A, a potentially really impactful transfer from another power five program. He's got them a commitment from a kid in 2020 in the class of 2024 in Marez Johnson, who is just completely lighting it up for St. Rita right now. I mean, like this kid's profiling as a likely top 50 recruit in the country and a potential five star like oh my gosh, like Tim Anderson's on a roll. And I don't know if Illinois is done yet. I mean, Jeremy Fears continues to take visits to Illinois, and that's something that's been led a little bit more by Jeff Alexander. But like, Illinois is on a recruiting role, and it's amazing what winning can do for you on the recruiting trail, right? And look at it. it it's, it's proof in the pudding for Illinois right now because they're going to sign another top five class in the Big Ten with, you know, Jaden Epps, who I think is going to be a really good player. You include that with Ty Rogers and Sincere Harris. That's a pretty good class. You can throw, I guess you can kind of throw Dane Danger in that class if you want. That's a potentially really good class. That's a high ceiling class with three top 100 recruits. You are hopefully starting your 2023 class here soon with Jeremy Fears or Kylan Boswell or Day Day Ames, or if you get really lucky and you somehow get JJ Taylor, I don't know, or someone else in the 23 class that, wants to commit early and then you've got a really good player in the class of 2024 that you feel good about. Like Ellen has got some real momentum on the recruiting show right now. Yeah. I will say like this, regardless, regardless of what happens this season, because this season might just be the season from hell where they get, they get to the tournament and they're like a 10 seed and they lose the first round or I don't know, they could win two tournament games, but whatever happens this season, I don't think like this two year stretch of Kofi and I own Kofi and then Kofi, like, it's not a, I don't think it's a blip. I don't think it's a fluke. It doesn't mean Illinois basketball is just going to like, for example, like Notre Dame, like Notre Dame was a few years ago. Like they had like the nice little, they had a nice little stretch. They did make an elite eight, but like that was kind of it. And they weren't a basketball program and they weren't able to build off that momentum. Illinois will, will be able to build off the momentum. And I think they're recruiting to continue to be a better big 10 team. And that I think is the most positive thing you can take away because Yes, there's pressure on this year. Yes, you want to make the tournament every year and make a run and finally get to a second weekend. But this isn't their last hope. Underwood and the staff have them going in the right direction. Yeah, and to quote Kirby Smart, it, and this is paraphrasing, and I'm sure you saw the same thing after Florida beat or after Florida lost to Georgia. Kirby Smart goes on this rant, not really a rant. He was asked a question about how important recruiting is, and he kind of goes, you know, it's everything. Like good coaching can never be good recruiting, and you know what? That's true, and. Yeah, like you can point to last year's Duke team and how that kind of fell on its face or last year's Kentucky team, which finished with like nine wins and 16 losses and how frustrating that was for a lot of Kentucky fans to kind of watch. You know what? Duke and Kentucky have been two of the five best programs since 2010. And Duke has been one of the five, three, one of the three best programs since 1990. And those programs recruit better than anyone in the country. And recruiting works. When you recruit well, when you recruit the best players, you tend to win more basketball games. And that's just the reality of the situation. Yeah, that's well said. Thank you. All right, so. I'm glad you agree. Yeah, um, so looks like we're out of the podcast. Football season is over. You're officially full-time basketball. Final final parting thoughts about Illinois football in uh, 2021. Man, um, before I get to that, Yesterday, I kind of want to tell a story, and hopefully this doesn't turn people off of the podcast, but I walked 
um, over to Memorial Stadium after parking my car and walking up. And I'm kind of thinking, wow, like I've been doing this for three years. Like I've been, I've spent every Saturday of my four years at Illinois at Memorial Stadium, except two. Um, they played Minnesota here my freshman year. I was at my cousin's wedding and then I missed um, the Northwestern game my sophomore year here. Every other home game I visited, I was at, whether I was working or I was sitting with my family in the stands or whatever. And the emotions kind of hit me as I was walking into the stadium and the emotions kind of hit me as I took my like pregame lap around the field that like that was my last time covering Illinois football at Memorial Stadium potentially. So I just want to say I'm really grateful for that opportunity. Uh, growing up, a, I can say this, growing up a huge Illinois football fan, I lived and died with what they did on every Saturday in the fall. And unfortunately, it was a lot of dying because they weren't very good for a long time. Um, but <laughs> I would also like to kind of throw in there that I'm super grateful for the opportunity that I had because I learned so much from everyone else on the beat. I learned how this works. I became a better writer and I will always be appreciative of those opportunities. But in terms of Illinois football, I actually think it's going in the right direction. I wrote a couple stories about how, you know, they can use this win against Northwestern, a blowout win against Northwestern as positive momentum going into the off season. That's huge. And I think for the first time in a while, this is an opportunity for Illinois to actually have sustained positive energy around the football program if they're able to build on it the right way this off season and then continue it into next season. So it'll be really interesting to see if they're able to do that, but I do kind of trust in what Brett Bielema is doing with the Illini football program, which is something that I don't think I've been able to say a lot that I trust the way things are going with Illinois football. Yeah. And they are, I mean, I follow from afar. I've been to Memorial Stadium one time for one game. So different levels of uh, Illinois football insight here, but I think that, they surpassed their win total. Like, you know, they weren't supposed to win five games, almost got a bowl game. You know, if a few call a few breaks go their way in some of these close games, they could have been a bowl team, which is impressive for year one. But now you're full-time basketball coverage, and hopefully Illinois basketball wins more than five games. But um, what can people expect from you this week in terms of coverage with two games? Yeah, I've actually got a good amount of stuff. I'll have um, I think it's already up actually, a story on Luke Goody. I kind of talked about earlier in the podcast that's up. You can read that. I'll have um, player grades. Of course, I'll have a feature slash a column after the game that you can read up there as well. I'll have something that I've really taken a lot of fun towards doing is this like five film favorites series that I've done. I took a little bit of a break from the games in Kansas city. So I could tour that place, get some good barbecue, visit the Negro leagues museum, which was really cool. Um, spent some time with family. So there'll be one of those. I'll have an Isaiah Williams football story on Wednesday. And then I will also have another basketball story on Thursday and then a couple more on Friday and Saturday. So I'm excited uh, for all the content that I've got coming and uh, make sure to give it a read. Yeah, I, I was doing film breakdowns. Uh, Feast week got too hectic with there being basketball on literally every second of every day. Like I just found myself parked on my couch and didn't get to Illinois games, but I'll have a film break. And I didn't want to do the UTRGV game just because I don't know like what it says to break down film about a team that isn't a team. So I'll still probably do the Notre Dame game, even without their full roster. Um, I actually broke down Chad Holmgren versus Paolo Boncaro on my YouTube page, my second YouTube video. If you guys want to get like an 11 minute, you know, what happened to that game between those two guys, if that interests you. And then I'll be actually going to Purdue twice this week. And I look to write on your guy, Jay Nivey, and how he's improved this year, and maybe Zach Eady. So you can expect that this weekend or early next week. Yeah. And make sure you watch those film reviews that Sim does, whether it's the Illinois one on Twitter. I learn something from those every time I go through and watch those. And I know he's trying to put a lot of work into the YouTube channel. Um, so make sure to give those a read. And he's a great basketball mind. That's obviously why I do the podcast with him. So make sure to watch Appreciate those. That. Well, of course. I texted you on Thanksgiving and said I was thankful for everything you've taught me. <laughs> but uh, yeah, make sure you watch those. And Paolo Bancaro is a killer. So you're going to enjoy watching those because you're going to see things that you didn't see if you watch that game live. But yeah, I think that's all the time we have for this edition of Inside the Arc. Thanks for listening, everyone. Sim, any last words? No, that's it for me. Thanks for listening, everyone. We will uh, get back to you hopefully later in the week with another podcast. Maybe we'll get a little preview of Big Ten play on 
Friday, Illinois opens that up before pausing again. So thanks Rucker, for listening. Rucker uh-huh. Rucker 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 week. Rucker's week. Talk about a rock fight. There you go. That there's your ultimate rock fight. Paul Mulcahy, baby. Everyone's favorite player at Rutgers. Thanks for listening, everyone. This has been Inside the Arc.